Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Mercif sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. <laughs> Let me just say that. We'll talk about that yeah. later. Have any lingering questions about COVID-19? Then you're in the right place. Today, we'll hear answers from Dr. Eric Topol, an expert who's been on target about the pandemic from the outset. We dive into the nettlesome issues for which clarity is difficult to come by. We discuss the fact that responses from the FDA, CDC, and the White House have too frequently seemed uncoordinated and not infrequently have lacked in transparency. Dr. Topol discusses COVID testing and asks the question, why isn't there greater emphasis on rapid testing? We discuss whether a booster shot is necessary and why, whether we can mix and match vaccines and how protective natural immunity is. We explore the topic of how we can better prepare for the next infectious disease crisis. Dr. Topol is a professor, scientist, and author. We discussed his classic book, Deep Medicine, which provides a rationale for artificial intelligence in medicine, how AI works, and the overall theme of the book, how deep learning can return humanness to healthcare. Artificial intelligence provides opportunities for better diagnosis, care, and greater efficiency. While we're in relatively early days of the digital health revolution, it's being led by innovators and consumers who demand and deserve better control over their care. Well, good afternoon, Eric, and welcome. Thanks, Gary, good to be with you. We're pleased to have you at the microphone today. You know, this show is about leaders and you've been a prominent leader throughout your career, uh, hard even to enumerate all your various uh, leadership tasks, but certainly as a cardiologist, as a professor, as a scientist, as an author, editor, founder, what do you do in your spare time, Eric? Well, thanks, Gary. That's kind of you. Uh, these days, my spare time is taken up by our grandchildren. Got uh, three of them here in San Excellent. Diego and have a blast with them. And um, so, you know, that's a lot of joy for us. What we'd like to chat about today is cover your early years and how you developed as a leader and then move to your views and wisdom on coronavirus. You've been a uh, prominent uh, thought leader throughout the pandemic, and then move to Deep Medicine, your book on AI and uh, deep learning that is already a classic, so congratulations on that. Um, to kick off, what was life like growing up for you, Eric? Well, I, I was uh, kind of a precocious kid. I you know, finished uh, my schooling before going to University of Virginia, um, and I just barely had hit age 16. Uh, so I kind of had a two grades that I skipped along the way and I landed in Charlottesville and, you know, I, I was way behind all the other kids. I didn't, I was socially a misfit. So uh, <laughs> that's how things got started for me. And that's kind of where, where, you know, I remember, you know, finally trying to assimilate, trying to get socialized with the other, the other kids. Um, and it was a challenge, but you know, fortunately, it worked out, and I had a had a great um, uh, time there. You know, some of my memories at UVA are among the the greatest of all. But you know, here I started much younger than all the other kids, and by the second and third year, I was the the resident advisor on the on the halls and the dorm. So that really brought me up to speed pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and I, I think that, that got me on a really good footing. What did the young Eric think about leadership? I didn't have enough respect for it. Uh, I didn't realize how vital it was. Um, you know, I was somewhat rebellious. I guess I still am to some extent. And, uh, you know, I think it took me a while to understand 
uh, its essentiality. Um, so, you know, I think that's something that uh, older age um, has really reinforced over the years. How about your parents? Did they influence your leadership style at all? My father uh, actually was uh, diabetic, uh, insulin dependent, and he went blind at age 49 and wasn't able to work. So there, you know, I, I watched him uh, really struggle. Uh, even before he be went blind from retinopathy, he was really having a rough time. Um, so I think it was more what both my parents, you know, dying young, having lots of chronic medical problems, it, it influenced me more in, to that extent. Not so much, you know, how I could be a leader, but more um, how healthcare is so precious and the lack of it is so profound. Well, we'll get to deep medicine later, but you certainly cover that uh, in, in that book. What about um, kind of your first leadership role? Do you remember a specific leadership role where you said, you know, uh, I enjoyed this, I want to, to be a leader more? Well, I'd say the first one actually was, you know, in, in college uh, to be the, the RA uh, for two years. And then after that, you know, I, I throughout med school, um, you know, there wasn't really an opportunity for me to take on, uh, you know, any kind of a leadership role. But uh, as I moved on, uh, I think, you know, in medicine and cardiology, uh, you know, I think that I had increasing respect for it. But really what it was when I went to my first job at University of Michigan, there I was, uh, you know, heading up an interventional cardiology program and trying to, you know, really spearhead clinical trials, uh, you know, brought together a, a, a group of friends and people. And so that's when I think I really started uh, to get into a groove of how I could be uh, a useful force and leader, um, how my ideas and innovation could help bring people together and, and inspire them. And that's really, it was really back in the late 80s when that finally hit me that, you know, we could do things that were really potentially impactful, work together, and I could provide, um, you know, uh, that kind of the glue and the force to uh, help us, um, you know, achieve what we had otherwise not expected we could do. I mean, we were, we were the young Turks, you know, and we were taking on some of the more established people in the field of cardiology, and it was really kind of interesting. Well, when did you decide to practice medicine or become a physician, Eric? Well, that's going back to college. Um, you know, I actually was uh, really interested in genetics, um, and I thought I would be a geneticist. Um, and I even did a thesis uh, on prospects of genetic therapy in man uh, in 75. But I needed to work in college um, to help uh, defray the costs. And so I wound up many different jobs, but the one that really uh, influenced me was at the University of Virginia Hospital, I got a, a, a night shift job as a respiratory technician. And in that job, I was, you know, working with the ventilators and the equipment and seeing people uh, who were in the intensive care unit who had like a Lazarus type effect where they were brought back to life. And it really influenced me because I thought, well, maybe I should get into this medical thing because that's really exciting. So I, I changed uh, gears uh, along the way. That job really um, had a, a notable impact. And that's when I decided to finish the requirements, you know, take the MCATs and, and apply to medical school. Your career uh, has grown from being a cardiologist to really inclusive of being a scientist, which I guess gets back to your interest in genetics maybe uh, in college. But as I look at you, I really think of you as a scientist. Do you, do you think yourself that way, Eric? Yes. I mean, I took a detour for a stretch uh, when I was doing cardiology procedures, you know, uh, balloon angioplasty and stents for a number of years and headed up that the heart uh, division at Cleveland Clinic for a quite a stretch. But along the way, I never lost my interest in the basic science, uh, particularly genetics and genomics. And as that became more feasible in the mid 90s, I got back to it. And so I, I always had this hankering for the, the, the science, the fundamental aspects. 
And so I was fortunate that I had the opportunity, um, you know, later uh, in my uh, career to really delve into it. And in fact, I made a conscious decision uh, to get out of clinical trials and to do hardcore um, research in, in genetics uh, again. So I, I kind of went from, you know, 1975 and it almost like a 15, 20 year gap and, and got back right into what I really love. You're superb at it for sure. Where did the interest in wireless technology come from? You were one of the early proponents of that for medicine and then of course AI. In the late 90s, uh, when you know, we were starting to see potentially a coalescence of medicine and the internet, uh, there was a company that actually ironically was based in San Diego called CardioNet. And they said they could monitor the people's uh, cardiogram and heart rhythm through the internet. And I found that kind of intriguing. And basically I, I was sent a packet to evaluate it. And it kind of had a said, whoa, this is, this is gonna be quite interesting if this can be done. But really um, what had the biggest impact uh, was um, when I came to San Diego. So now we're at uh, end of 2006, beginning of 2007. And while my interest had been kindled in, the, in this uh, wireless medicine thing, uh, now I went to this conference, we're talking about February 2007, that it was organized by Qualcomm, which is uh, the number one uh, company here in San Diego, a wireless medicine, wireless company, not at all in wireless medicine at that time. Anyway, at this conference, there was this um, presenter of an idea of having a camera in a smartphone connected to the internet. And I was sitting in the back of the room and I was sitting, I just woke up and these people were arguing, why would we ever want that? Why? Because we have point and click phones that we have in our pocket that uh, point and click cameras in our pocket that are so high in resolution. Why would we ever want to do something stupid like that? And of course, you know, it wasn't until November that year when there's such thing as an iPhone was created, right? So I, I, all of a sudden I had this eureka moment that, hey, you know, if you could take pictures of stuff like a skin rash or who knows what, you had sensors in your phone, now you're connected to the internet. So I actually, you know, I came to San Diego to start a human genomics Genetics Institute. There was none in San Diego, but that was the day I decided, no, we, we're not going to do that. We're going to add this whole wireless digital medicine. So we had the first academic program in the United States. And what was interesting about that, Gary, was that we started to see the bigger picture was you can't understand people just through their DNA. You need these other layers of information and sensors like a camera or other wearable sensors would give us this extra dimension to understand people uh, and, and potentially provide better health care. Really, it sounds like that was the impetus to what now is your interest in AI and individualization and so on. Uh, so that's very cool. Well, if we could turn for a moment to the coronavirus pandemic, then we'll come back to, to deep medicine and all that that involves. But um, one of the questions is in regard to testing. And it seems like once the um, vaccines became available, our interest in testing waned. Uh, does that make sense to you? Is that wise, do you think? No, not at all. Um, we need testing more than ever, especially rapid testing. The problem we've encountered is there was this kind of vaccine-centric strategy and there was never an embracement of rapid home tests, which of course could help us navigate schools and kids going to schools and all the staff and teachers and has been used in so many other countries very effectively. But here we banked too hard on the vaccines getting us out of the woods. And what we didn't uh, anticipate was this Delta strain uh, that was gonna be so formidable. And there, even people who are vaccinated are not fully protected and don't know that they may actually be incubating or harboring or actually going to get sick with a Delta uh, virus infection. So we need those rapid tests to keep everyone protected. And uh, that's something that I, I hope we'll see because we started the US pandemic 
without any testing for two months, got way behind the, the virus spread throughout uh, the country. And now we have the similar uh, problem of not having adequate testing and we're not measuring up to countries that have really excellent performance. Is there a good home rapid test? So is it a question that the test is actually available? We just don't use it here? Well, there's 67 of them approved in Germany. There are two uh, cleared in the U.S. The issue here is it's not even, there's many very good tests. They're, they get down to less than five minutes with higher accuracy than the ones we even have available here, which are too expensive and in very short supply. They work best when the government of the country gives them out for free, like in the UK and Denmark, Germany, and many other countries. And so that's what we should be doing um, because we want to promote people knowing if they're infectious. That's where they're, that's sweet spot. Um, and within minutes, you know, you, you would know that you got to stay home. Don't go in or interact with other people because unwittingly you may well be infectious. So um, we don't have the FDA buy-in to this principle here, nor do we have the governmental support of its urgency and utility. Yeah, unfortunate to say the least. Uh, kind of relates back to our whole strategy and resources available for public health, which, which uh, really needs to pick up. But in terms of the vaccines, we've seen a lot of, heard a lot about breakthrough. How do you think about these breakthroughs, how should we interpret that? Well, the term sounds kind of alarming, right? Breakthrough. But actually, yeah, right. uh, what we're really concerned about is people getting ill to the point that they may even have to be in the hospital or actually in the hospital or in the ICU or dying. So it's one thing if you just happen to have um, a test that it, you know is positive once you've been vaccinated and you don't really have symptoms or they're very mild. But then, you know, so many of these people that have these breakthrough infections are getting quite sick. I've had many colleagues, uh, because we got vaccinated, you know, very early in December, January, who've gotten quite ill right on the verge of going in the hospital or even being hospitalized. So um, this has become a real problem because it wasn't envisioned. We didn't have it at all in the first you know, six months, essentially. And only when July started and the Delta really took over in the U.S., it turns out it's probably more time than it is Delta, but it's some type of interaction of the two because Delta is so much more infectious. So, you know, now I think this is a problem. We need to get uh, a booster third shot program moving. We have lots of infighting among the leadership of the U.S. at the FDA and NIH and um, CDC and the White House. So this isn't good. This is not a good recipe for moving forward. But I, I hope we'll get the the resolution um, and get the follow the science. Obviously, there's this competition of global vaccine equity, but there's no reason we can't do both because we have lots of vaccines that have been distributed in this country that could get us uh, on on solid grounds to prevent these breakthroughs that are much more worrisome in people over age 60 or in healthcare workers. So are you comfortable with the science, what we've seen out of Israel? I think they were testifying maybe in front of the FDA today uh, and what we've seen reported from Pfizer and Moderna and I, I think maybe J&J, &J, but are you comfortable with the science there and are we really uh, positioned to think that we ought to all have this, uh, this third dose? Well, I have to say, I think the Israeli scientists are first rate. Uh, I know several of them having visited there uh, and what they've done, because they are our laboratory for the world. They're the only place that has millions, over three million people who've had a third shot and they're following them. And they have, of course, electronic health records for everyone. So even though it's a small country of less than nine million people, we're learning a lot from them. What bothers me is when people just discount their data and say it is not a value. Now, it isn't the same representative of the U.S. data. There's different, uh, you know, lack of diversity relative to our country, but it provides unique insights. And I think that data is vital, especially, and as you mentioned earlier, we don't have the public health commitment to have the right data in our country. 
So we're very dependent on outside countries that collect and analyze their data. And Israel's doing a great job of that. Question has arisen about mixing and matching. In other words, if you had a first shot that was J&J, &J, Pfizer's now available, or Moderna may be available as a, as a booster shot. Um, should you take that uh, when you can get it? If you started with J&J, &J, do you have any thoughts? Or is there any science on that, Eric? Yeah, there, there is quite a bit on that. Uh, it isn't so much on the J&J, &J, but we can impute that from the uh, adenoviral vector of AstraZeneca because they share a lot of features. And what's remarkable, what's remarkable is if you take an adenoviral vector first and then an mRNA, whether that's Moderna or Pfizer, as the second dose, you get the best vaccination immune response that's ever been seen more so than two mRNA shots or more than two AstraZeneca. So um, that would be the best. If you're looking for the most potent immune response, that would be it, especially if you separate eight to 12 weeks between them, because that's another thing is that Pfizer three weeks dose spacing was probably too fast and it didn't allow for as much of a memory uh, and the immune response as we'd like. So. That is a real, now, interestingly, we don't really have any data to support the opposite direction. If you had an mRNA vaccine first, will you benefit from uh, a J&J? &J? No, we don't have any data to support that. It doesn't look nearly as, as promising. What about the intranasal uh, vaccine? I, I've heard you talk about that uh, various points and times, and it sounds like something that we should be really digging into, but I don't know that that's happening. What's your thought about that, Eric? Yeah, it's frustrating because we put, we basically doubled down, put everything on shots. But shots, you know, are activating our immune system in our bloodstream, not in our upper airway, the lining of our nose and uh, mouth and throat. And so this is a problem because that's where transmission is. And so we don't, we haven't had a transmission centric plan. And so while we got behind all these manufacturers of the shots, we haven't gotten behind the, the, the nasal and oral vaccines. In fact, just last week, an oral vaccine that had can be stored without any refrigeration and gets the, you know, basically that's so-called mucosal immunity, which is that barrier established uh, of your airway. That's what we need now. So uh, well, actually, we needed that at the beginning of the pandemic. I hope we can put our pedal on the on the metal and get this done because there's 20 of these out there, but we haven't, you know, supported them. And these are often startup companies, and you know, some have considerable promise. So I, I hope we will do this. And you know, an oral vaccine is very attractive, um, particularly if it doesn't require any refrigeration. What you're thinking about natural immunity, uh, I've heard a lot of discussion about that. I'm not sure what the science is, but there seems to be pretty solid immunity if you've actually contracted COVID. What you're thinking about that, Eric? Yeah, I think over the months now, we've seen um, a lot of new data to tell us that prior COVID, natural infection is um, a very important type of immunity. And the reason why is when we give a vaccine, we're just giving basically the spike protein. That's just one part of the virus. Whereas when you get infected, you don't want to be infected, but if you do, you're basically making antibodies to of many other key parts of the virus that come into play. And it looks like you develop, you know, very uh, durable antibodies and and cellular T and B cell response. The problem is that that's not good enough. That is, if you add a vaccine, one dose on top of uh, the natural immunity, you get super human immunity, that's so-called hybrid immunity. So we have these people out there who've had COVID and they think that they're bulletproof, but they're not. But they would be pretty much if they just would get the darn one dose of vaccine. One of the things that I think is really unfortunate is we have no plasticity at the CDC. So as you know, we have these cards and you got to have two shots or else you don't get your card is no good. I don't know why we're using cards. It's 2021, right? Yeah. Anyway, there are to have a line for if you had prior COVID and you have a test to back it up, 
that counts. You know, that that's as good or better actually than one of a, dose of any vaccine. So we we just can't figure that out. And another thing is, so many countries do that, and we just can't have. You know, we're so bureaucratic about our our practices. It's just silly stuff. Are we going to reach a point of what they call herd immunity or population immunity? Yeah, population immunity would be nice. We would have had it if we didn't have Delta. You know, we were looking really good at Alpha uh, by by May. This country early June, it was as good as it ever had been. And had Delta never come and arrived in this country, which of course was unavoidable, but um, we were getting there. But now it's a reset because this is so hyper contagious. Now we need 85% of the people in the country, 85% or more with either um, the vaccination induced immunity or we'll take prior COVID, ideally with the one dose, but that's 85% and we're at 54%. So, yeah, and if you add in some prior COVID, we might be at 65%. We've got 20% or more Americans that need to get uh, vaccinated um, in order for us to be inside because we have such a ferocious uh, strain of the virus now. It sounds like the plan for employers to mandate, um, which, mandate a vaccine, which is causing a lot of political problems, but that would probably hasten our movement uh, toward uh, getting that 20 percent you're talking about vaccinated. Um, you know, thinking about transparency, I mean, starting with the snafu at the CDC on testing seems like 100 years ago, but um, there's been, uh, as I talk to leaders in health systems and health insurers, there's been a I would say a lack of trust developing that's based perhaps on just seemingly a lack of transparency uh, without trying to be political about it. What's your thought about that? How can we develop the trust again in our agencies here? Yeah, I know they all have great intentions and some really sharp, uh, extraordinary people, but the communication has been dreadful. Um, you know, the, the best example recently, as you can appreciate, is when, you know, over a month ago, the president says we're going to have a booster program and we're going to give it everybody who uh, is eight months and it's going to start on September 20th. Uh, and that let, rankled the people that, you know, ultimately two key players resigned from the FDA and the CDC and some of the people at FDA revolted. And then they changed from eight months to six months to five months back to six months. And who knows what it'll be next Monday. Um, this is not communication that is acceptable. And it has to be much more careful and consistent and, um, you know, driven by the science and evidence. And so I, I, I'm I kind of stunned. You know, I, I knew how bad it was last year, but this year, I actually thought we would get in the groove, uh, but unfortunately the, the, the miscues have continued and I hope they will improve uh, and get to where they ought to be. They need to be, because that's what engenders trust. Another thing I just want to say is that, you know, I started putting out on Twitter several weeks ago that we have a breakthrough infection, breakthrough disease problem, pro, problem which hadn't been acknowledged by CDC. And when I did that, I got a lot of backlash. Oh, no, you're going to help feed the anti-vaxxers. Well, you know what? If you tell the truth and you get the public so that those who've been vaccinated gear up and wear masks and, and know that there's some liabilities out there, that if they got vaccinated early, they may be uh, at risk. And so um, that was instructive for me that people don't want the truth. They want happy talk. If you just give happy talk, People just like that. Well, you know what? That's not the way to communicate either. We have to tell the truth, even if it's a hard truth. If we were talking two, three years from now, what do you think we'll look back on as lessons learned from the pandemic? I mean, communication is the obvious one. You've been talking about that. But what other lessons do you think we'll learn about our approach to public health? Well, uh, we gutted our public health in many respects uh, well before the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we, we're putting trillions of dollars to uh, Afghanistan war while our public health uh, commitment and resources was eroding. 
Uh, it was never as good as it should be, even though CDC commanded global respect. Um, you know, I think we need to have a pandemic preparedness like never before, and we should be leading the world in this. There's no excuse that we don't have stockpiled vaccine um, readiness for any uh, virus that, you know, on the list of the top three or four, whether it's influenza, a coronavirus, Nipah, whatever, we should be ready so that the day that hits, we're squashing it. And obviously there's an interaction with climate change too, that's forcing a lot of this. We should be all over that as well, because, you know, it's the interaction between the climate um, effects and um, the pathogens that's also uh, putting us at increased risk globally. So, you know, we have to work with all of the players in the world. We have to have a much more deep commitment. And it can't just be money. You know, you just throw billions or trillions at it. That's not enough. We have to be innovative and we have to have a commitment to lead and cooperate with, with all the, the forces on the planet. Well, let's turn to a happier note, which is deep medicine and how AI can help return humanness to healthcare. I love the book. It's just uh, really an action-oriented book. Um, I hate to ask this, but how can you consolidate 300 pages into, you know, a very short interview? But could you just give us a kind of a top-level view of deep medicine and what you were uh, accomplishing with that book? It's counterintuitive. Most people would say, well, technology, how could that enhance humanity? How could that make us more humane? But I think that's what grabbed me is that everybody's talking about AI to do this or that in, in, in medicine and health, but the overarching potential is so exciting. is how we can use it to bring back the patient-doctor relationship the way it used to be. Uh, it was precious. There was, um, a, a, you know, this deep empathy and exquisite bond, human-to-human -human bond. And so we can use AI to do that if we go after it. And that, you know, there's so many other things that the book gets into that AI could do. It's still in the early uh, phases uh, of that. But if we don't lose sight of where we can go with this, we, we actually could get a quality of medicine that you and I would want, all of us would want, that you know that your doctor has your back, really cares for you. And the flip side is, as you know, there's a global crisis of burnout and depression among clinicians. And why is that? A lot of it is because people feel they've lost their ability to care for patients. They've lost their way. So we could even get that back, which is the, the morale and the excitement of um, what it is, that, this noble uh, privilege that we have of being uh, trusted to care for patients. Last decade was important to this with the High Tech Act, which basically digitized uh, medicine and also an explosion of technology. Where would you rate us today, Eric, in terms of just the technology and data available to personalize medicine and pursue some of these uh, uh, kind of um, uh, optimistic sorts of things that are in the book. Where do we stand? Are we in the first inning, second, third inning? Well, it's hard to put it in an inning. We're certainly not at the seventh, uh, but we're we're probably in the first or, or second inning. Uh, uh, you know, I think what we have is we're long on data. We've got whole genome sequences, sensors galore that capture data continuously, almost any physiologic system of a human being. We've got no shortage of data, but our ability to process that data in a meaningful way, we're, we're, seri we're severely impaired. Where, where we will be eventually in the years ahead is we'll take all of a person's data, their biologic layers, their anatomy, their physiology, their environment, their electronic records, all of those uh, data, and all the pertinent medical literature up to the moment for that person to prevent illness. That's where we can go. That's what's so exciting. But we are not even, we haven't even taken the first baby step. We haven't even stood up as a baby yet, sat up, but we will over the times ahead. Yeah, we will. Uh, I'm confident of that. If we were here at the end of this decade, 
Eric, I think the book Deep Medicine would look like a absolute roadmap for how we were going to proceed. Um, what what application, what clinical applications of AI exist today? Can you point to one of them that is um, a clinical application that uses AI that is is actually being used and is useful today? Well, the one for for physicians that's most widely adopted and still early is the uh, interpretation of scans. So already it's getting into many health systems for radiology, all different types of scans. But one that is, I think, um, gotten pretty well validated prospectively is diabetic retinopathy, which going back to the earliest part of our conversation is an important area that I see um, for 50% of diabetics never get screened and it's a preventable cause of blindness. So that can be done in grocery stores with AI now, uh, where a person sits down and they, they have a retina picture taken in the AI deep learning algorithm gets your immediate uh, answer of whether you have any retinopathy and what should be done about it. So that's, I think, something that, that I uh, feel, ophthalmology is zooming ahead, um, probably has made the most momentous contribution so far in AI. A lot of people don't realize it. Um, and in Europe, skin lesions are going to be, every, anyone be able to get a, an, a, a differential diagnosis with probabilities by taking a picture from their smartphone. So things are moving, for sure. How are physicians accepting this? <laughs> Not well. <laughs> they feel that somehow or other, this, this change is not uh, acceptable. Um, there's some good reasons for it, like lack of randomized trials and, you know, the kind of compelling data we all would want. But the bad reasons are feeling threatened, not understanding that this could be the greatest thing could ever happen in terms of making their lives easier, better, restoring the ability to really care for patients. So I, I hope that over time, we'll see physicians and clinicians in general embracing AI. We need that because if they do that, not in a blinded way without understanding the nuances and the liabilities, but if they are more open-minded, we will make progress. But I think you know that medicine changes very slowly, unless it's associated in this country with more reimbursement. Uh, it, it's it's a sclerotic, ossified, uh, hard-to-move um, profession. What can we do to increase adoption and kind of speak to and perhaps eliminate some of these barriers to use clinically? I'm hoping if we gear up with um, the doing the right kind of prospective, rigorous work that is uh, transformative, uh, we will see um, that it will be irrefutable evidence to move ahead. And I think there's a commitment now. I, mean, I think we have new standards for the leading journals of what they're going to accept. And so the, 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 we're, we're fortunate that just in the first five years of having AI in, in medicine, we're seeing a commitment to high quality uh, effort. So I think that, you know, we are start, we're going to start to go at a pretty high clip in making progress. Chapter nine in your book, uh, Deep Medicine, was entitled AI and Health Systems. And you brought up the um, idea of predictive modeling uh, in that chapter. Uh, what you're thinking about uh, where we need to go with predictive modeling. It, it strikes me that uh, that's one we'll have to work, we kind of have to work some magic with some of the physicians to get them to to embrace that. What, what's your thought there, Eric? Yeah, there, there's two two levels, Gary, of the predictive modeling. Um, one is, you know, when a patient comes in the hospital that you would have the AI give you a heads up about their their risks that you might not be able to simulate. You know, you know, you might be able to see it from your clinical acumen. The other one that is even more intriguing from a standpoint of how big it could be is the uh, ability to do remote monitoring and keep almost, you know, the vast majority of people in their home rather than in a hospital. So when you do that, you know, when I was involved in the National Health Service UK review, um, because it's a uh, has universal health care, the commitment to that was easy compared to this country where, you know, hospitals are a major lobbying force. But, um, you know, for modeling um, who 
can be kept at home uh, and uh, would not decompensate and anticipating when there's the earliest signs of potential decompensation. We will go there. I mean, we'll not use hospitals like we do now in a decade or more. So that's exciting. I, I think health systems are not in this country are not aware of that opportunity, largely because they rely. The hospital is, you know, one point three trillion dollars, the number one line item of American health care. So, you know, it's very, it's going to be hard to change mindsets on that. Yeah, it'll be hard. But I'm a subscriber to the fact and I think your book really points this out. I think the consumer, uh, the individual is going to lead the way. I mean, they want what you, what you're espousing in the book, and pretty soon they're going to not accept anything but that. I mean, do you have that feeling as well? Yes, um, I do think that the people that are following this, particularly, they're, you know, they're they're savvy. That we should not uh, at all underestimate what you're bringing up, which is democratization of medicine. Um, that there, there's a yearning for having more a charge, more control, being able to capture your own data, get interpretation. Um, and I think we're going to see almost all the common diagnoses, whether it's, you know, I mentioned skin, ear infections in children, urinary tract infections, heart arrhythmias, and on and on and on. They're going to be able to get a lot of those screened by themselves. Uh, and someday they're going to say, I'm not going in the hospital. I'm, I'm having the sensors in my home and you can send help if I need it kind of thing. We're not there yet. We're not at the point when people have smartphones and they're doing their own smartphone ultrasound imaging throughout their body, but we'll be going there someday too uh, in some respect. Yeah, no question about it. Um, what about, you, you mentioned the health systems uh, and I think the health insurers probably in the same boat aren't perhaps aware of how fast this might come. Um, what do you, when you meet with health system leaders or health plan leaders, what advice do you give them for, <laughs> for, for being aware of what's coming down the pike here? Well, I mean, I think there's a myriad of opportunities with AI and um, we haven't scratched the surface really. I mean, there's a lot of back office operations that could be replaced with AI. You know, human scribes, you know, we have something like 60, 70,000 human scribes that go into a clinic visit with the doctor so that the doctor can actually talk to the patient. Well, I mean, really, we don't need that. We should have synthetic notes um, and that is much better than, than uh, the notes we have. So there are all these different ways that we can implement different types of AI in our daily practice of medicine to not just save costs, but deliver better care. Um, but also the idea that we get to have more time with patients. That is the gift of time. And we should be, I look forward to the day when health systems in each city are competing with each other for giving time for patients and doctors to come together, not seven not 12 minutes, but, you know, much more. That, that time together is a critical um, metric that, that we don't have right now. I agree with that for sure. I see more and more founders starting companies that have to do with AI. And I would imagine they kind of make a pilgrimage to, uh, to your uh, Scripps research. Uh, so do you see an increasing number of founders with good kind of applications, AI applications for healthcare? Oh, absolutely. There, there are, as you say, hundreds, perhaps well over a thousand. There's in every aspect of whether it's medicine and life science, drug discovery. I mean, you just, they, it is incredible because this, I think, is the biggest uh, potential shakeup in the history of medicine, uh, just because there's so many different nodes of entry to disrupt, um, when you can automate things, when you can be more accurate. I mean, that's not something we, ha we haven't really discussed yet, but we have a serious problem with medical errors in this country. Uh, and if, if we can start to get those down to a, we'll never get down to zero, but 20 million a year of serious diagnostic errors that you and I, all of us are going to have one at least in our, in our lifetime, we can't afford to have that continue. So, you know, I think um, 
there, there's a lot in the diagnosis space, um, but also we're starting to see things more uh, in terms of, as you say, predictive modeling, treatment, remote monitoring, you name it. There's AI startups and the tech titans, you know, Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Salesforce and all these others, they're, they're making a big play on this as well. For sure. Eric, unfortunately, we're running out of time. This has just been an awesome interview. We're, we're very grateful for your time. If I could ask one last question, we'll kind of go back to the beginning about leadership. We have a number of early stage leaders uh, in this audience. What advice would you have for an early stage healthcare leader? The idea is to not um, accept any dogma, um, you know, challenge it and, uh, you know, work with your team to kind of be that inspirational force of, of questioning, not accepting things that are widely accepted, because oftentimes that leads to, you know, better ways to do things or new ways to think about things. And that's, that's what I've been doing for decades. And that goes along with telling it like it is, which is um, something we discussed about the pandemic. And I think reading that, cultivating that, you know, the constant vetting and reassessment of things is really healthy, it's important. And that's what I think we should be promoting among young people so that they are not just passive, that we all become activists and question things continuously and come up with better ways because whatever we're doing now, there's a better way of, of doing it in the future. Dr. Eric Topol, author of Deep Medicine, uh, our audience needs to buy it, needs to read this because it's a good one and it's important for the next decade or two in healthcare. Eric, thank you so much. Terrific interview. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation.